طيب ان شاء الله تعالى so once again i hope you guys could all see that uh, the powerpoint and then um, myself and i have and i have the chat box open so if you have questions as we are going uh, you can um, uh, um, type it in uh, in the chat box there and then um, you could also privately send it to me you can send it to the whole entire group so either way works okay so we get started in one minute here. Let me just fix my lighting here real quick and then shall we get started. Inshallah, I was going to do something else. Okay, Inshallah, let's get, let's get started. Allah Rajim, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, wa salatu wa salamu ala alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Inshallah, ta'ala, everyone is doing well and in good. Um, health. Um, these are definitely interesting times um, that we're in, uh, at least uh, from this whole setup that we have. But if you've been uh, attending this uh, CEDAW class with us for how many weeks we are now, we're in the 11th week, you can see that what we're going through is nothing to complain about and nothing to even mention what the Prophet وسلم, and his um, companions went through, right? I mean, we've seen multiple stories of persecution, um, getting, having to leave their land and uh, live in, in Abyssinia, in the, you know, East, Eastern Africa, um, you know, people trying to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all these different things. And of course, leaving Mecca to go to Medina. Um, so Alhamdulillah, at least we could stay home in our house. Um, usually our house is a nice comfort place. And so, um, you know, you know, for other people like the, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, they had to leave their house, right? Um, and so this is something that's quite minor compared to what we have seen. And this is the reason why we study the seerah and go over these stories and go over the life of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, to understand uh, the struggle and sacrifice that they went through, the early Muslims. And there's a saying in the Prophet ﷺ that if you are overburdened by problems and think about myself and think about my life, and your problems will be decreased, right? Meaning that um, if you put it in, in terms of that barrier or of that in, you know, that uh, in that criteria, you see it's not as hard as, you know, what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all, mostly all the prophets had to go through. So this is one of the benefits, once again, that um, obviously that, you know, studying this class and going through it. So um, hopefully, inshallah, like I said, everyone's in good health and well and keeping safe and following the directives of the of the state and government and your local you know uh, government's board and work schedule etc. And so inshallah we we'll get started. So this is the 11th week that we're in. Last week we were kind of finishing up on the Battle of Uhud. And the Battle of Uhud, um, uh, we talked, we kind of finished a little abruptly last week about how the Prophet Sallallahu was able to escape up into the mountain and the Quraysh left that scene there as they had like a discussion as the Muslims were up in the mountains and Abu Sufyan, the leader of the Quraysh, was yelling out to them and saying how they have won and they have now, um, you know, have something as a uh, revenge of what happened at Badr. And then we, met, we left by saying that how they left the battlefield, they mutilated some of the, the Muslims that passed away or were martyred on the battlefield and there was around 70 or so Muslims that martyr, were martyred that day. There was about 14 or so um, Quraysh or, or non-Muslims that were killed in that battle. So the numbers were swapped from the numbers on the Battle of Badr. And that's where we kind of left from. So now um, we're going to just go over some quick lessons um, from the Battle of Badr, uh, sorry, Battle of Uhud. So number one is that there's tons of things that we can say about 
how, um, what do the Muslims learn? Uh, number one is that success um, and victory relies in following the Prophet Sallallahu And so the first point of that is obviously they were told by the Prophet Sallallahu to uh, stay in Medina, right? Don't go out and fight. And they chose to go out and fight. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi still took their opinion. And then we have the order of the archers, right? To stay on the mountain and don't uh, leave that area, even if they're winning or even if they're losing. And we all know from the story and this, you know, quite famously that they left, 40 of them left out of the 50, and that led to the downfall of the Muslims. And so one thing we learned from there is that, first of all, they broke the, the command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to stay where they are, right? Think about, you know, their own opinion and also the wealth, right? Money, <laughs> money's tempting, right? They wanted to go on the battlefield and pick up the swords and pick up the shields and gather the horses that the Quraysh left uh, over than what the Prophet ﷺ has ordered them to do. And that's what, something that me and you will be tempted with. Not necessarily swords and uh, shields and camels that we might see, but uh, money and, and come in different ways that maybe sometimes we are put to work for a company that maybe are not in the most halal um, type business um, what they do, and um, whether that's in the finance sector or sometimes in engineering, you have companies that maybe are in the defense industry, and it could be a uh, debatable of the products that they are making, and uh, you have to make that decision. Well, the, the you know the the, the money that I'm going to get, the, you know, my salary is going to be six figures. It's going to be this. I got a bonus. I got a 401k. I got stock options, but you know. What is, is it something that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will, will approve or what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will approve? And of course, when money comes in front of us, our eyes, our eyes get big, right? And so the same thing with the archers, their eyes got big and they left, right? They totally forgot about the order of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, they wanted to gather how much, you know, whatever they can. And so that's the same thing that me and you will be tested with in this world. If you've you're already been tested with multiple times, probably if you live long enough, that um, these type of financial tests comes to us, right? And you, can, you could debate about, you know, uh, mortgages and whether I should rent or should I get a house? Uh, that's a bit of a touchy debate, but it's still something you should be conscious about what you're doing with your finances, right? Um, another thing is balance, is that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send down angels every single time and the Muslims will win, then guess what happens? They kind of rely on that, right? And so therefore, Number one, the Muslims are not necessarily sincere in their fighting and their battles. And also people would just join in just for the benefit of winning. And not necessarily because of their iman is uh, fortified in believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you read the first verses of Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, Allah, or second verse of Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, um, the, the surah starts with Alif Lamim, so it's the second verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he will definitely test us to see who is our truthful and who are the ones who are weak in Iman, right? It's just that it's, it's natural. It's going to happen. And it's part of the filtration process that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does to those for the believers. And so number point number three is talking about the hypocrites, right? So we want to know is that who are the ones who are just tagging along for protection, but really trying to hurt the Muslims in the background or trying to water down the religion, or trying to change it, right? Uh, whether their intention or maybe for other reasons, <clears throat> but the hypocrites, actually their intention is that the, that case. And so we saw really very wide, on, wide and openly that Abdullah ibn Ubay, um, the head of the hypocrites and his 300 men left the battlefield like right before the battle, right? And so that really calls them all out that these 300 people are the ones who are um, not true, true in faith, and you need to know that, uh, or else you might get hurt by those people that are from you. And we talked about that multiple times. And then I put here Surah Ali, uh, Surah Ali Imran. I kind of mentioned this last week also. There's around 60 verses or so in this surah that pertains to the battle, um, verse 121 to 179. Uh, some of them is addressing the battle directly. Some of them is kind of more in general. Um, but roughly from these these verses talk about this battle. And like I mentioned last week, I really want you all to have connection to the uh, events of the Sirah and how does that relate to the Quran. And that will definitely bring a lot more meaning 
and bring the Quran more lively to you. Uh, when you read it, you're like, oh, that's the battle of Uhud. I know exactly the context. And it'll be a whole different reading of the Quran now, now that you know and you studied it and you have that information. Um, well, there's some verses here that I put from Surah Ali Imran just to kind of um, go on. And so verse 152, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and Allah has certainly fulfilled his promise when you were killed, uh, when you were killing the enemy by his permission until the time when you lost courage and fell to disputing about the order given to the prophet. So basically you're winning, you're winning that battle. And then you just disputed, you disputed the order of the prophet Sallam. Should we stay on the, on the mountain as the archers? Or should we come down? I think we're winning. I think the, the war is over, right? Let us go down. And they obviously did. And disobeyed after he had showed you that which you love. What is that you love? Obviously, wealth, money, right? And this stuff of something that's in the heart of all of us. We just have to crave, you know, um, to try to control that, that craving of it. Among you are some who desire this world. You want to, you know, the wealth. And among you are some who desire the hereafter. Well, the Prophet Sallam told us to do this. I'll get rewarded to it, even though there's a lot of money sitting right in front of me. Right? I could just grab it, right? I could just pull down a machine and I put a quarter in and I might get X amount of money. I could bet on this basketball game, on this football game. I could get a lot of money. Then he, then he turned to you back. Then he turned you back from them defeated that he might test you. And we all know the Muslims started being defeated, right? They started losing the war there. And he already forgave, forgave you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave the archers already, um, which is amazing. Allah's rahmah. I mean, we could talk about Allah's rahmah all day long. But these are individuals that pretty much almost cost the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa right? The Prophet almost died because of that. But Allah forgave them. And Allah is a possessor of bounty for the believers. And then I put another verse here that talks directly how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa dealt with those archers and dealt with the people um, that disobeyed him. And this is a great lesson for us as, you know, sometimes you get arguments with people that let you down and, um, and you know, and maybe don't follow what you have to say, right? Especially in a, like, you know, marriage relationship, uh, children, etc. cetera. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here in verse 149, um, so by the mercy of Allah, by rahmah, by the rahmah of Allah, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you were lenient to them. That you, by your the Allah's mercy that Allah instilled in you, you were lenient on those who disobeyed you that day of in the battle of Ahud. And if you have been rude in speech to them and harsh hearted, if you would just lash them, how can you follow this, uh, you know, disobey this order? Yeah, I almost died. You cost so much lives. Like, you know, why can't you listen, etc.? Right? They would have disaband disabandoned from you, right? They would just have left you and this, you know, obviously they, they're humiliated, etc. So pardon them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to pardon them. I mean, look over that fault and ask forgiveness for them. Right? SubhanAllah, right? The people almost cost you your life, right? And consult them in the matter. Like basically still take their shura, still talk to them in their advices in later on, you know, events, etc. And when you have decided, then rely upon Allah. And Allah loves those who, are, who rely upon him. So to see some of the, you know, aspects of mercy here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. And when you read that verse, 159, and you understand the context of it now, about the archers, that, that verse turns into something totally different now, right? That makes a, that verse, this, you have to stop after reading that one verse and like, like subhanAllah, really ponder on that. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked the Prophet to forgive, right? And like, you know, still work together, right? And still, you know, People are going to make mistakes. People are going to make some really bad mistakes. Okay? And so that verse is, you know, it's subhanAllah. I wanted to put that there so that we could, we could ponder on it a little bit, inshallah ta'ala. So what's happening now? So next, um, right after this battle, obviously in the middle, the Muslims were kind of beat down. The Quraysh left the battlefield heading, heading back to uh, Mecca. And so the Prophet Sallallahu as they went back into Medina and kind of recruited the next morning, he said, you know what? I have a feeling they might be coming back. And if they do, we're going to be in trouble. So let's go out. So this battle, this invasion of Hamra al-Asad, Hamra al-Asad means this area in the, in the desert where the Prophet ﷺ marched out. And he said, everyone that came Ahad, you're coming with me again. Imagine that. You just got defeated in a war. You're, a lot of people died. You get back home. You know, you're kind of tired. You're kind of 
you know, morally you're kind of down. The Prophet says, the next morning as you wake up, you maybe you could think about sleeping in, think about taking a little rest. No, let's get out right now again. Let's head down south and see if the Quraysh are making it back up, right? SubhanAllah, that's a big test to get up now. There's no break now, right? And most of the people um, follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, especially what happened before with the archers. They say, yeah, yeah, we'll follow exactly what you say, right? They're not going to make that mistake again. So the Prophet went out and the Quraysh already was already 35 miles south of Medina. The Prophet some didn't go that far, but then try to find out what the Quraysh was doing. And it ended up happening, there was a man, let me see if I have uh, another slide here. I'm forgetting my slides. Yeah, there he goes. Oh, is it the same as next slide? It is. I put it twice, don't worry. Um, the, the, there was a man that took Shahada in that area, became Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu ended up sending him to the Quraysh, and the Quraysh didn't know that he was Muslim. And so he said, you know, the Muslims have marched out again, and they have a large army. And so Abu Sufyan and the Quraysh started worrying that people who were left in the city that didn't come out for the battle are now coming out, and they have extra, you know, uh, backup now and reinforcements. So Abu Sufyan decided, let's just leave. Let's just take the victory, and let's not ruin it. Ruin it. And so they went back. The Prophet Sallallahu stayed there for three days. No one showed up. Of course, the Quraysh didn't show up. And then they went back to Medina. So this kind of gave them a little kind of like, as we say, more honor and kind of like power and pride that after being defeated, they went out again and the Quraysh didn't show up. And so you see the wisdom of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to pick up the morale, um, even though it's tough to go out there. And so they see the Quraysh don't come back. So it's kind of a, you know, a win for them there that shows that like, look, we're not down and we're not out, um, but we still have, an, you know, some power to come back. After this, uh, one thing we haven't really sp spoke a lot about is the uh, internal affairs of the Prophet so his day-to-day -day activities, people that he interact with, and of course, um, the marriages that happen. So at this time, uh, the Prophet so Sallam, after the Battle of Ahud, it is mentioned that the Prophet married Hafsa bin Umar ibn al Khattab. And this is the daughter of Umar, the second Khalifa of Islam and the great companion of the Prophet. And her husband, like I mentioned before, a majority of the Prophet's wives were widows, right? That people that, you know, their husband passed away and they're left with kids. And, um, and also, number two, there are some of the Prophet's best friends. I kind of mentioned this point also. That, um, that the love that they had amongst each other, and especially if you have a prophet amongst you, you want your daughter to marry the prophet. I mean, that's number one, that inshallah, she's gonna go to Jannah, and that might obviously work out for you, some benefit too, and that's such an honor to marry a prophet, and the list goes on, right? So Hafsa's um, husband, Khunais, was martyred in the Battle of Badr, so she was by herself. I'm not too sure if she had kids or not. I'm, I'm reading the story. I, I didn't get to research too much, but I, don't, I didn't mention if she had kids or not. And so Omar first went to Uthman and asked him, would you take my daughter's hand in marriage? And why did the Omar go to Uthman? Because Uthman was previously married to Ruqayya, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu and she passed away after Badr, if you guys remember that. And so he wanted to like, you know, offer her um, to him. Obviously, they're great friends. He's a noble Sahabi, you know, companion, right? This is the people you want to sort out in your community, right? You want to go and see who are the salihin and the righteous amongst our community for your sons and your daughters, right? Because these are people who are, whose deans stick out, um, and you don't, that's what's going to last when you're looking for someone to marry, right? Not necessarily their wealth, or their good looks. Good looks are obviously super important, we all know, right? Um, but like the Prophet said, you know, go for someone with their deen, with their religion, because that, inshallah ta'ala, will last. And then Uthman Rahilahuan kind of said, I'll get, kind of get back to you. He didn't give, her, like, give him like a sure answer. So then he went to Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr and, uh, and asked Abu Bakr Rahilahuan, once again, extreme, uh, you know, companion of the Prophet, you know, this honored, esteemed. Etc. Asked him, "Would you like to marry my daughter?" And Abu Bakr Rahman kind of said that I'm, you know, I'll maybe get back to you. Too. I'm not really thinking about marriage right now. 
And so the Prophet it's in Omar goes to the Prophet and says, you know, um, starts to complain about Uthman <laughs> and, and, you know, and what's going on. Like, I'm going to these people and they don't want to marry my daughter. You know, like, uh, you know, what type of, and for them, it's like a brotherhood thing. You know, like, hey, it's kind of disrespectful. You know, um, you know, these are people of honor. And so the, what was the situation is that, that they, Uthman and Abu Bakr wanted Omar to ask the Prophet about his, ask his daughter to the Prophet first and foremost. Right, and that's out of the respect, right? So Omar Lahuan asked him, and then he kind of said, you know, maybe someone um, in a great status will marry your your daughter, kind of hinting to himself. And so Omar Lahuan didn't obviously would love that, and so he offered to marry um, his daughter to marry the Prophet Sallam, and also married her in this third year, right? And um, she was like middle age, exactly. I don't know exactly her age. And, um, and so uh, she was end up being like the third wife of the Prophet as of right now. So let's take a track of the wives of the Prophet currently. We have um, Aisha, we have Sauda, she was the first woman to like, marry the Prophet after the death of Khadija. Then we have uh, Aisha, so that's the second. And then now we have Hafsa ibn Umar ibn al Khattab, anha. Um, that married the Prophet وسلم, right? And then there's a there's another there's a Zainab anha that I'll talk about. I don't know if I'll get for it today. I'm, I forget if I made a slide about it. Um, I don't think I did. No, that she. Uh, it's sometimes they're a little iffy on the exact date when these marriages took place um, because they always look at the the person's husband when they passed away, what battle, and that's usually what they know when the the marriage kind of took place. So there's another person named Zainab. That we'll, we'll hopefully get to next week. I didn't have time to make a slide for her. Um, that's also mentioned that she married the Prophet Sallam around this, this time after the Battle of Uhud, inshallah ta'ala. All right, so next week, hopefully, we'll talk about that. Hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, you guys are all following along. I don't know what happened to my mouse. There it is. Okay. So what happened after Uhud? After Uhud, until the next major battle that took place, in the fifth year, uh, called the Battle of the Trench, or Battle of Khandaq, or the Battle of the Confederates, Al Ahzab, that happened in the fifth year, there's a lot of little skirmishes once again that happen. Um, and, um, and so here, the Prophet Sallallahu and these little skirmishes, we can't go over all of them because, um, like I said, it's going to take a lot of time. But the Prophet will send groups, as I mentioned here, 100, 150 people to go out to the Bedouin Arab tribes. And we say Bedouin Arab tribes are out there in the desert, kind of away from the main cities that kind of live out in these remote areas, if you will, right? Um, like, you know, like Indio or like, you know, out in Victorville and Hesperia and Barstow, if you're, you know, the geographic locations here in Southern California, like way out there in these desert areas, right? Kind of away from like the major cities and the counties. And so they showed some, um, some animosity to the Muslims because the loss of Uhud kind of showed that people are, hey, the Muslims are not all that, all that powerful. And the way it was at that time is that you want your, your tribe to survive. And when you see one tribe getting really powerful, you start to worry about your own tribe. You're like, okay, how about if they come knocking on the door to us one day, right? We have to make sure we're ready, either we're gonna join them or we have to fight them. And so, there are always an animosity to the new kids on the block, right? Who are these Muslims? Where do they come from? They're in Mecca, now they're in Medina. They're ruling our area. They have the main town of Medina or Yathrib, right? So a lot of people are just like uneasy. And of course, they're not worshiping the same idols that they're familiar with. So they know that's probably going to be an issue or something that friction is going to happen. So they started trying to um, cause issues with the Muslims and see how they could attack Medina. And so there's multiple plans that the Prophet heard of these little tribes trying to see if they're going to come, if they're, they're planning to come to Medina and attack the city. So the Prophet sent out different delegations out, or little small armies, I should say, to protect and find out what's going on, um, to protect Medina, find out what's going on with the situation. So all this is happening in the fourth year. Okay, so now we're in the fourth year after the Hijrah. So the Battle of Uhud was in the third year. 
you know, I should probably do a timeline maybe next week so make sure everyone's following along with the course of events in the chronological um, order, if you will. So we have this, one of the events that's significant to talk about is Ar-Raji. Ar-Raji was, ar was a place in, in the desert area. And why were this significant? It's because there was some Bedouin Arabs, once again, came to Medina. And they asked the Prophet can you send some of your companions to our tribe out in the desert to help us learn about this new religion? We heard about it, we like it, okay? And obviously, I like, put on the slide their deception because this is one way they say they could take advantage of, of the Muslims. So the one thing is the Prophet is also worrying about, um, not in terms of trying to defend Medina and try to teach the Muslims and to take care of his wives, et cetera, and his daughters, is that he has an obligation to spread the message of Islam. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah, that's his main question that he'll be asked. Did you convey the message? Right? Was it clear? Did you teach the people, et cetera? Right? So when you get an outside tribe that comes to Medina and say, hey, we want to learn about Islam, your eyes are going to light up. Right? Even us, right? If one of our co-workers come and say, hey, uh, I've been, you know, I heard you're Muslim. I want to learn about Islam. You're like, seriously? Right? You're like, you, know, you want to stop the world and see how you can help them. Right? That's really rare to extend. Right? Usually you have to bring it up in conversation. What someone else does, you know, it's a whole other thing. So here they came to the Prophet and said, can you send some of your sahabas, right, to come, your companions, to come and teach us? The Prophet obviously from his good heart, right, it says, okay, I have sending these, these 10 sahabas are well known, I mean, well versed in Quran and, uh, and understand, you know, obviously the tenets of the faith to go out and teach this, this, this tribe out there. And so when they go to this place called Ar-Rajin, was this area in the desert, they were all martyred. It was a set of ambush, right? They never wanted to learn about Islam at all, right? They came there, they came to this area, they were sitting there and then people popped out from around them and then shot them with arrows and then attacked them. And it's mentioned that two, all of them were killed except two. And then these two individuals were traded back to Mecca, when I want to say traded, you know, kind of like slaves, if you will, to Mecca for, for money. And that's why the desert tribes knew that the Quraysh didn't like the Muslims. So if they could capture some of the Muslims and then sell them over to Mecca, I know this sounds so terrible, right? But it's not just movies, right? Um, this is what they did, you know? Hey, we could get some money. We could make money on capturing Muslims. And so that, that's what they did. They, they captured these two and they sent them over to Mecca and they got paid X amount. And so one of them, it's a story to bring up, his name was Khubayb, and Khubayb was, ended up being crucified on the outskirts of Mecca, right? And he was the one that was fought in the Battle of Badr, so the people in Mecca knew that he killed some of their relatives. So they definitely didn't like him. And so Abu Sufyan um, uh, said something um, very interesting to him, that he says to him that, wouldn't you like, that the Prophet Sallallahu or the Muhammad, he wouldn't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam obviously, he would say, wouldn't you like that Muhammad be put in your place right now and that he would die and you will be safe and you'll be with your family, right? Basically trying to get him to denounce the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, and speak bad about him. But Khubayb, look at his response, he said, by Allah, I swear by Allah, I do not wish that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were in, in the place I occupy or that a thorn could even, you know, touch him. And then I was sitting with my family. When someone says that right when they're about to get killed, everyone who's standing around hears that, saying like, what type of people are these? These people are like dedicated to the Prophet. They like love him, right? They're like staunch, right? That puts like fear in their heart. Like, who are we really fighting? Right? These people are not just for my money and wealth, right? And obviously he was crucified. And inshallah ta'ala, he's amongst the um, shuhada, the, the martyrs of Islam in, in the highest places of Jannah, right? After sacrificing his life for this. But this is like the response they gave back to him. So this is the event that happened here. And you can see here, this is a big event. Like 10 people die, right? 10 Muslims die. That's not a small number at all. Uh, but this is like the little skirmishes that are happening, happening here between the, after the Battle of Uhud. There's another one that's really wor um, worth speaking about. 
and that's called the tragedy of the, tra the tragedy of Ma'un or the Ma'un al well, okay, or the Ma'un al well tragedy. Um, and I put taken advantage of. So once again, there was a person by the, um, that came from this tribe of Banu Amr, and Banu Amr once again a tribe out in the desert. They come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam again and ask, can you send some Muslims to us to teach us Islam? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, obviously knew what happened just a short time ago. It's mentioned this event and the one that just happened just now at Raji'i was like almost at the same time. Some people say it was a couple of days um, between each other or a week. Okay, and Like I said, the one opinion that says that at the exact same time this happened. So they came, and so the Prophet ﷺ obviously didn't want to make the same mistake. So we asked him, he said, I'm afraid that the people of Najd, and this tribe was from the place called Najd. Najd is like the middle of Saudi Arabia, out in the desert there were no really major cities out there. And he said, I'm afraid the people of Najd are going to kill them. So Abu Amr says, no, I will give them my protection. So you might say, this kind of, you know, baloney, like, you know, everyone says that. But actually, in that time, when someone says that, that's like strong wording, right? The other tribe didn't say that last time. But this person here says, you know what? I will protect them. Like, they're under my protection. When I go back, I will say, hey, these people are under my protection. Nothing should be done to them. And that's actually how things were, were done. And actually, that's an honor system that actually was understood. And people rarely broke that. But obviously, there's always exceptions, right? And so the Prophet sent out 70, right? 70 people. Um, that's a lot. The last time was 10, right? And they stopped at this Ma'una well, this well area. And what they do, they what they did is that they sent out a messenger to the tribe of Banu, Banu Amr to give the, the letter to the people, to the chief from the Prophet. And that's what they'll do first. And that letter will be calling them to Islam, explaining who he is. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And so what happened is there the leader of this tribe of Banu Amr, his name was Tufail. He um, Amr ibn Tufail. He ended up killing the messenger. Just kill him right away. And so the thing is that, well, like even if you watch these old like movies, like I said, I don't urge you to watch movies, but um, back in those old days where like you know the messenger comes to the king and delivers a message, like you don't ever kill the messenger, you're just delivering a message, it's kind of known that they have protection and they're not touched, etc. So number one, he killed the messenger, which is like a big no-no and it's kind of against like war time rules. And number two, that he was under the protection of the person who came to Medina. So there's two things that really went bad here that he went against. And so this leader, Amr ibn Tufail, goes out and goes up to his tribe and Banu Amr says, Who's with me to go out and kill the rest of the Muslims that are out came over here? Try to, they're coming over here trying to convert us, and they think they're this and they think they're that. And the people of Banu Amr actually had some, you know, some loyalty and honor. And they said, you know, we're under their, that this, that those people are under the protection of this person from our tribe. Remember that? I mentioned that. So we're not going to touch them. They're under his protection. So that we have to make sure that we're not going to touch them and we're going to honor that. So I'm going to fail, like my own people won't help me. So he goes to another tribe and he gets them and they go and they end up ambushing the Muslims of Ma'un well um, at, this, at this well area and killing all of them. There were two Muslims that were shepherds and they were nearby and they, it's really you know, kind of a little scary, but they saw birds circling the area where the Muslims were sent. So they know that some this probably someone died or some kind of war is going on. One of them said, I'm going to go there and defend my brothers. Other one said, I'm going to go back to Medina and go tell the Prophet what happened, right? And so the one who went to go defend, uh, go to defend them, actually obviously getting killed by the time he got there, all the Muslims were dead and he got killed also. The other one was Amr ibn Umayyah. He goes back and on his way back to Medina, he takes rest, obviously, he takes, you know, time to get back to Medina, even though he's in a hurry. He only could travel so much in one day. He took rest under a tree. And it so happened that two people from the tribe of Banu Amr, the one that tribe that just killed the, the companions at the well, were coming. And they saw him and they talked to him. And so he thought he was like, oh, they're about to kill me. That's what he's thinking, right? 
And they sat down to take a rest under this tree as they were traveling also. So he said, oh my gosh, they are probably, well, what is he thinking, right? He's probably thinking, I know they're probably going to try to try to kill, kill me right when I go to sleep. So once they fell asleep, Amr bin Umayyah, the Muslim, gets up and kills these two people from Banu Amr, thinking that they're probably the ones that are in this plot to kill the Muslims. And then, the, then Amr bin Umayyah goes back to the Prophet ﷺ and tells him what happened. And so, you know what? I saw two more people from that tribe on the way, and I killed them as a revenge of what happened. Thinking that the Prophet is going to say, Good job. Right? But little did he know that the Prophet gave those two people his protection. Of course, the Prophet didn't know what happened over there. So they're under the protection of the Prophet. Right? And so, therefore, he tells Amr, and he say right here on the top of the point here, that you have killed. You have killed two people, and their blood money shall be the debt, the debt I have to discharge. Basically, you killed them wrongfully because they're under my protection, and they were part of that whole plan that happened um, in the Ma'una well. And if you think about it, Banu Amma, um, remember when the, when the leader came out and said, who could go and kill the Muslims at, the, at this well? None of the people joined him, right? Because they all said they are under protection. So technically, they're... They're not at fault. It's only the leader that's at fault. So he's saying that, you know, we have to play blood money now, that you killed two innocent people. And that's a lot of money for the Muslims, especially at that time when they're still fairly new and they still have to build up their economy and they have a lot of poor Muslims that came from Mecca. So just showing you here that there's an incident here I wanted to bring up is that the Prophet ﷺ was so disturbed by this, because if you think about this, never really this unprecedented that the Prophet sends out a delegation of Muslims and they get killed right next to each other, right? If you add up the number, that's like 80 Muslims right there. That's more in the battle, uh, battle of that, that died. Okay, so that's super significant. It's almost like another battle took place and you lost 80 of your fellow companions and you didn't take, end up killing any of the other enemies, right? And so this is very, very significant. So the Prophet does something he never did before. And it's mentioned here for about 30 days at the Fajr prayer. He will make a special dua against these two tribes, right? That killed the companions, right? And, and you really see it from the so far, if you guys, you know, been taking this class, you've seen the Prophet really doesn't make dua against people. Like, may they be destroyed. He, he's a man, you know, he makes dua like, may Allah guide their offspring, right? You know? Um, but so you rarely see this. And so obviously this is definitely something that, um, that calls for that type of dua. So for about 30 days, for about a month, for at Fajr, every Fajr, the Prophet will make, we call it like a, like a kunut dua, like, a, like dua kunut you make in the winter prayer. He will do it at the Fajr prayer. Um, and it used to be after the, the in the second rakah, after you, come up from bowing, okay? In the second cycle of the prayer, when you come up from bowing. And so he would come up and then he would make this dua for 30 days and against these people. And so that's why some of you guys maybe took the Salah class with me, is that some of the madhabs right now allow you to make dua um, in, in Fajr prayer all the time. It's because the Prophet did it for uh, these, these 30 days. And we call this uh, Kunut and Nawazim, basically, if there's a Kunut that do a Kunut that you do when there is some type of tragedy. And when this happened yesterday in this um, group of individuals, in this chat group that I'm on, that were saying that, you know, for Fajr, today, they're talking about today, that we need to do a dua Kunut for the situation that's going on right now with the coronavirus, that may Allah, you know, obviously protect us and do away from this, this sickness and give us a Shifa, give us a cure. And so, um, because of the, you know, the situation. So that there's some precedence for that that we have, and that's where this comes from, this event right here. So if you do hear about that, the thing is not praying in the masajid, um, because obviously you all know the situation. Um, it's temporarily closed because of, you don't want to, you know, spread the virus around. So um, and so you could do that yourself uh, if you want to, if you know the du'a kunut, and you could Google it, you could find out. It's kind of like the same du'a. Um, that's mentioned in uh, the winter prayer. You could, and you could, have, you could be flexible in that du'a. 
and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection and so forth. <clears throat> so that is the tragedy of Ma'unawal. After this, if you guys go, now we're going to go back to um, the situation of the Muslims in Medina and the Jewish tribes. And so we talked about that there's two main Jewish tribes that are, um, that are, that are, uh, whatchamacallit, they're in uh, Medina, right? And we said there was one called Banu um, Ainuqa, and we talked about how that tribe is already got evicted um, from the Muslims because of, remember, they tried to pin down the dress of a Muslim woman in their, in their bazaar and um, in their markets, and that ended up being causing a fight and, and death, and also they're plotting against the Prophet and they're doing a bunch of other things. And so, um, and they were evicted. So there's two other tribes remaining. And one of the tribe is the Bani Nadir, that you see on the screen here. And the, and the other one is um, uh, Banu Quraida, right? Uh, those are the next two main Jewish tribes in Medina. So going back to the Bani Amr, that tribe that killed the, the companions of the, of the Ma'una well, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that how um, those two other people that were killed on the way by the other Muslim, that they have to pay the blood money for those two individuals. And if you guys remember that contract or that um, treaty or uh, covenant that the Prophet ﷺ made with the Jews when he came into Medina, one of the points was that if anything happens in terms of war, that the, they will come to the aid of each other and they shall they'll help them with the expense of war and protect the city and, and other, other points. So now the blood money is due against the Muslims because of this. And so the Prophet Sallallahu according to this agreement, he wanted to go to Bani Nadir and ask them for some type of financial help in paying this money back to that tribe, for those two individuals that were killed. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi obviously extremely smart and obviously guided by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. He knows that people are mistrusting him and uh, are putting mistrust in the Muslim and they're trying to take advantage of the situation and they're trying to test the Muslim to see how strong they are after the battle of Ahud. And that he wants to see their loyalty um, because just like the other tribes, um, the Jewish tribes in Medina, they're also causing a lot of skirmishes and they're uh, foul mouthing, if you will, the Muslims and, um, and saying different things. Right to cause type of, type of dissent uh, in the in the community, and so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Let me pay them a visit and see if they will help with the financial obligation to pay back this pay back this blood money to the tribe of Bani Amr, and also Bani Nadir were our allies to that tribe uh, before Islam came to Medina. So there's some type of relationship with them. So maybe they might um, fordo that amount. Maybe they'll decrease it. Right. So there's there's some type of relationship there. So the Prophet Sallallahu wants to ask them um, what if they could help out. So the Prophet goes to their leader and his name is Huyay ibn Akhtab. And he asks him, would you like to help in this? And the Prophet Sallallahu brought Umar, Abu Bakr, and Ali with him. He didn't want to go by himself. Right? He brought the crew with him. And they said, yes, uh, we will help you. Right? Yes, we will put some financial you know, um, assistance to you. And they said, you know, we're having a meeting with our, our, our leaders and we'll come back and reply back to you how much that we can give. Remember, they used to live in like forts, right? So the Prophet is almost understood that he's waiting behind these big, you know, doors or gates of that fort. And so they said, why don't you just stay there and we're going to go have our meeting and we'll come back. So as they are sitting there, they're waiting and they're sitting under the 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 wall of these big forts, they hold this, this meeting and they come and they talk about, you know what, we have Muhammad right here. He only has four companions. He can end his life right now. We'll go on top of the wall. They won't see us there. He's sitting right there. We'll just drop a big rock on his head and boom, crush him and then he'll die and that'll be it. And there's only three other companions there, three other Muslims, if they want to fight them, They'll be outnumbered, and they're and we're done. We got their leader exactly what the, where we want him, right? And so that's where they came up with. They actually plotted to do that, right? They weren't discussing how much money they're going to give to the, the Muslims or help out in the situation. 
Jibril alayhi salam, angel Gabriel, um, obviously his main job is to communicate to the Prophet sallam and protect uh, the prophets, comes down and tells the Prophet sallam that Bani Nadir, Nadir and their leaders have decided to do this and try to plot to assassinate you. And this is their plan. They're going to go up and drop this rock on your head. Basically, leave now. So the Prophet automatically gets up, tells his companions, let's go, and starts walking. He doesn't even tell them why he is leaving, but they, they understand that he's probably leaving for a certain reason. He gets up and goes. And there's a big, there's a lesson here though, that if you have a leader, right, and they tell you to do something, yes, you could obviously ask, like, why are we doing this for? Is there a reason why we're leaving, right? The Prophet doesn't sit there and explain what's kind of going on, and Jibril came, and I think they're gonna, they're gonna come and drop a rock, so we have to leave now and then explain it to all of them. You know, and some will say, well, let's go and fight them. They might have different opinions. It's just that, you know, just follow your leader and just go, and then we'll explain later on what's going on. You have to have trust in your, um, in your leadership, right? So the Prophet says, just go. They all follow him, okay? It must be a good reason, and they walk off. The Prophet ﷺ later on tells them, they're plotting to kill me and drop this stone on my head. Send a message to them right now that they have an ultimatum, that they leave Medina right now because of their plot of assassination. And that goes against the, 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 co the covenant or the pact or the treaty we had with each other, that we won't harm each other, right? And that's kind of like treason, obviously. And so, um, uh, so go ahead and, and uh, tell them that we're gonna um, either have to leave or they'll have to face war, okay? So they go ahead and they tell them that, I should evacuate Medina within 10 days. So they give him 10 days. So the Prophet sounds like, you know, he's reasonable. You have 10 days to leave. I mean, most people say just get out and we're going to, you know, kill you now or you're going to have to face war. The Prophet is, you know, Latif, yeah, I mean, he's like really light and lighthearted. You guys got 10 days to get ready. You know, you could think about they could be recouping their army and getting and, and ready in 10 days. Right? You think that, you know, something you want to say, the Prophet stop being so nice. You know, this, you know, you know, you have to be, you know, put your fist down, right? We see the Prophet's heart, subhanAllah, this is how the way he is. That's why when you even read the Sirah, you see the wars that he was in and the evictions he does to the Jews. He does it with such, with such ease. He, gets, get, he lets them do what they kind of want sometimes. And you're going to see that. And, um, and, so, and you can see that, you know, that actually ends up harming the Muslims a little bit later on because of his um, leniency and his you know, his mannerism and his likeness. And like I said, you have to be balanced. Muhammad al Prophet is being balanced, obviously. Um, but it's showing you like any of the, it's not like the war general that people try to depict the Prophet at least on Muslims try and, you know, do so. But if you read the books, this is what you see. And the one thing I wanted to kind of emphasize, because someone could say, hold on, these are all from your Muslim sources. That's why the Prophet of looks so nice. Because these are Muslims that wrote the books, right? You know, let's read what the non-Muslims wrote. Let's see if they say the same thing. And then we will give that balanced approach. And you say, you know, that, hey, that's fair game. That makes sense, right? This makes, that makes sense, right? If I ask you, how are you as a person? You're like, oh, alhamdulillah, I'm a good Muslim. Can I ask your wife how you are? Also, like, no, 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 please don't ask. No, no, no. I'm sorry, sorry to bring up that topic, right? Well, I have to get a balanced approach, right? I have to get the other side, right? If your wife says you're a good person, mashallah, they're not saying, you know, you know, or if your children say this, or your mother says this, or your father, your brother, your sister, then we know, like, that you are, mashallah, a good person, right? Um, but the same thing here is that someone might bring up this type of argument. But when it comes down to it, only people that are writing about the history of the Muslims at that time and the life of the Prophet Sallallahu we're Muslims. <laughs> that's it. You don't have anyone else. You don't have a Christian, you know, historian that's sitting in Medina writing down what's going on and witnessing what's going on. You don't have the Roman Empire has a depiction of the Prophet Salaam, what he's doing every day. Like I said, no one really cared too much about what was going on in the Arabs in this peninsula area, right? You had the Roman Empire, you had the Persians, they were fighting each other. They wrote a lot about each other, but no one was really focused on it. So you have no history books. Now you can go back and say like, well, what did the Quraysh say about that? Well, what did the historians of the 
um, Bedouin Arabs say about him, right? You don't really see that. You have some incidents where the Prophet sent a letter to, um, to the Roman Empire, and you see that even the leader, his name was Heraclius at that time, um, maybe we'll get to the story in, in a couple of weeks, I don't know, um, talks back and say like, you know, this sounds like a noble man, a prophet, uh, people who are following him, they actually speak good about him. They see Abu Sufyan, one time he's asked about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, how is he? Like, uh, is he like, you know, tell me his character. And Abu Sufyan, if you read the hadith, because later on becomes Muslim, right? So he tells the story honestly of what he said when he was a non-Muslim. You can't really depict anything negative. He couldn't find anything bad to say about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? His wives, if you look at the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you think the wives might say a little thing here and there, Right, but you rarely see that. Only thing I say that he didn't want him in the house, want to spend time with me here, want to spend time with me there. Right, but nothing about like ill character and mannerism. And when someone's depicting your life every single moment, if you slip a little bit, believe me, that will be recorded. Right, but you have you don't really see instances like that. You have the time when the Prophet saw them, you know, frowned at the blind man. Yeah, and I mentioned in the Quran, like frowning. I wish some people would just frown at me. I mean. People do all the different types of stuff to other people, right? So this is how the Prophet was. Right? I think that's a point that's wanted to mention. That if you try to look for non-Muslim sources about the Prophet's life, uh, you really wouldn't find anything that's historically done. Maybe today people write about him that don't non-Muslim that don't like him or whatever. But um, but historically, if they go back to the original sources, you're just not going to find that. Um, so the Prophet some laid siege to the. Um, to the Muslims, uh, sorry, the Muslim lay siege to the fort for about six nights, right? Some say around 15 nights, right? Almost like you say like two weeks, if you will, right? And once again, just like many Qainuqa, uh, if you guys remember, they don't come out. They stay in their forts. There's a lot of talk because what happened is that Abu, um, Abdullah ibn Ubay, the hypocrite, was talking to Bani Nadir and says, hey, stay in your forts. We're going to come with 2,000 people, and we're going to basically try to, uh, uh, try to assist you. Okay, don't worry. You stay there. Don't give in. Of course, Abdul Bey never shows up. Same thing he did with Bainu Qainu okay, with the other tribe. So Bainu Nadir, a lot of talk, right? They don't come out, but they fight from their fort. So this is a little different. They, fight a, they have a palm grove that's around their, their area. And they're shooting arrows at the at the Muslims, and the and that's becoming some of a distraction, because when you have a lot of palms, trees, and y'all we are California here, you guys seen palm trees, right? But we, I don't know if you've seen palm groves though. I have to go out to like yeah, like I said, Palm Springs, Indio, to see that. When you have palm groves, it's kind of hard to walk between them, right? And to and to kind of you could hide if you will, but here that they had this around that city around this fort and the the Quran and the and the Mani Nadir was there shooting their arrows and so what the Prophet did to try to get them out of their forts because they locked the door they, they weren't coming out right and you don't it's hard to fight them because anytime you come close you're gonna get hit with arrows so it's a little bit of a standstill and you have them on that's what you call a siege right they're just nothing's really happening they're gonna have to come out later because they can stay in their forts forever they're gonna run out of food they're gonna run out of water and so what happens the Muslims took their palm trees and started burning them and cutting them down. Now, the Prophet has a very strict order in terms of warfare, right? You don't kill elderly, you don't kill women, as long as they're not fighting against you, right? Of course, children, you don't um, knock down or, you know, attack houses of worship, even if they're Christian, even if they're, you know, whatever, some type of temple, uh, you don't do that. Right? That is still respected. Right, and that's what the Prophet followed. And you don't cut down trees, and you don't just ravage, you know, resources, unless it's a act of war strategy. So the Prophet actually burned, ordered to cut down some of the palm trees, and burn them down, to hope that the Jews will come out. Many of them will come out because that was their livelihood, is agriculture, right? date trading, and so that's like their money right there. And so to burn that down, he's hoping that they will come out, right? either to surrender or do something, right? And they probably would surrender because their wealth is getting burnt up. And also to help with the battle because it's hard to move, maneuver with all these tree trunks everywhere. Okay. 
So even, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he addresses this in the Quran that it was a permissible for the Prophet to do that in this instant. He's not allowed to do it in general, but just in this incident, then he was allowed to do that. And I think I have the next. Yeah, there we go. Um, and the bottom point right here in the slide is where I wanted to go to. If you go to Surah Hashr, that's chapter number 59, this entire surah pretty much talks about Bani Nadir or what happened with Bani Nadir. Okay. Um, I wish I was able to read the surah. It's not very long, but if you go down verse by verse, it'd be kind of nice because I could tie it with what's going on in the battle. Because of the lack of time, um, we don't, uh, we can't do so. Um, Ibrahim, if you're there, if you could just tell me. I have my PowerPoint on. I can't see the time. <laughs> I don't have a watch on me. Um, I don't think there's no watch clocks in this room here. But you can just tell me when I have like 11.45. Oh, okay. It's really important to know the time, inshallah. Uh, so five minutes, inshallah. Tell me. I have to make, we have to make sure we're done in time um, because of Dr. Siddiqui's class are using the same link, I believe, to start his class at 12. So if you're attending that, you can just stay on. And um, I'm going to let this keep on going, mashallah. We live our life online now. That's pretty much what we do now. If you could eat online, we probably would do that also. But we haven't got to that point yet. So anyhow, so the Prophet says, um, finally they gave in. And they read the message of the Prophet And they said, you know what, we will abide by it. We'll evacuate. We will, um, we will leave the, this, this city. So the Prophet said, okay, you can leave. And look, look at the rahmah, look at the mercy of the Prophet He says, you can leave and take anything you want except your weapons. Right? Because obviously they take the weapons, they're just going to regroup down the street and come back and attack you. Right? So the Prophet obviously says, okay, just, you know, just leave your weapons. If you think about it, they should leave everything. So it may be harder for them to start back again because they'll build up again once again. But if they could take all their wealth and their gold and their silver and their clothes and animals, and, you know, for them, it's just starting right over. Okay? And that would be easier to start over, I should say. So it's mentioned that they had 600 loaded camels. And it said that in the books that they even took like their door frames out and their pillars in their houses, right? They took like everything, right? And um, Allah SWT kind of mentions in, in Surah Baqarah that they'll hold on, the Jews in the Bani Israel, they'll hold on to this dunya, you know, like severely, right? The, the material wealth. And so they held up so many things that the Muslims had to watch these camels go by that were stacked so high, right? This U-Haul camels, you, know, you can talk, you can think about that, right? That, you know, were stacked so high and they went out to this place called Khaybar. Khaybar is an area north of Medina. And they went there and some of them settled there and some of them went to, to Syria. Um, but Khuyay ibn Akhtab was a leader of the tribe, went there and he settled there, if you will, right? So some of you might say, once again, if you don't kill them off, the Jews, this Bani Nadir, they could set up shop somewhere else and come back and what? Hit you again. And we're going to see that's, pro that's pretty much what's going to happen in the next couple of years. Not right now. It's going to take the year seven. And that's pretty much what's going to happen. There's going to be a battle of the battle of Khayla. And so that's why people say, well, you should just kill them right at the beginning. Like I said, it's the mercy of the Prophet you know, to let them go, at least keep their weapons they cannot allow to take their weapons, but once again, the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu we can see that, you know, we're, that's a little bit too lenient. And we can see that, but that was the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu That's what I'm saying. If you read the Sira, it's very hard to say that the Prophet was anti-Jew or, you know, anti-Semitic. Technically, Arabs are Semitic also, right? Semitic, the word Semitic comes from the word Sam, one of the, technically the one of the sons of Nuh Salam. And so Arabs are from that, that lineage also of Sam, so there's Semitic also, right? So anyhow, so it's very hard if you really read the Sirah, the life of Prophet Sallam to come up and see the Prophet was actually anti-Jew or didn't like the Jews, but they actually tried to assassinate him when they had a treaty in Medina. So therefore they deserve what they got. So there's a little map here. It's very hard to find like good maps about the battle because a lot of people, I mean, it's not really documented, you know, with exactly, you know, um, miles and kilometers of exactly where but if you see like the prophet sallallahu masjid over here i'm not too sure if you see my my um cursor 
but you see that unless you're in the Medina, there's like way south, right? Like I said, I see the word way, you can't really tell if it's how far that is, but they're way south here and they had their own location here, right? Banu Quraidah uh, used to be over here. Okay. And um, uh, the Banu Quraidah is still there, sorry. They're the, they're the second Jewish tribe that's still in Medina. Well, Medina, the Nadir just left. So they're the last ones over here. They're all to the south where the palm grows, so where, if you will, I kind of put that there. Okay. And um, I, I'm assuming it's probably 1150 right now. But uh, so I was going to talk about the second battle of Badr. When, remember, if you guys remember, Abu, Abu Sufyan, when he left Uhud, he said that I'm going to, let's meet up one year later at Badr, if you guys remember that. So that's why I was going to go over here. Basically, in the synopsis, I'll make it really quick. The Muslims head out with 1,500 soldiers to um, Badr, wait for, the Prophet, wait for Abu Sufyan and the Quraysh to show up. The Quraysh had 2,500, 2,500 soldiers leaving from Mecca, coming up to Badr. In synopsis, they never show up. They stop halfway or a little bit outside Mecca. They regroup, and what happened, there was a famine going on that year. Why should I say a drought? Sorry, a drought. And so a lot of their um, animals was, um, didn't produce a lot of milk, and so them themselves didn't have a lot of food. And so they were deciding, should we still go and, and fight the Muslims? Um, because this could turn out really bad. And so Abu Sufyan, you can see a little fear in his heart now, says, let's just go back and regroup. This year doesn't look good because of the, the drought, and let's try to regroup and come back and fight with them the next following year. And you're going to see that's exactly what they do um, in that situation there. Um, and last one, at least really quick, and if I can sneak this in, the Prophet marries Umm Salama. This is now the fourth wife. It could be possibly the fifth. Um, but this was the fourth wife. Um, um Salama, Raylahu Anha, was married to Abu um, Salama. He was uh, martyred or got hurt in the Battle of Ahud and passed away later on, about a month or two months later on. And she was a middle aged woman. She had younger children. Um, and the Prophet Sallam, knew of her uh, piety. She was one of the people that actually um, that migrated to Abyssinia. And they came with her husband to Medina, and her husband was uh, wounded in Ahud and then passed away. And so the Prophet Sallam admired her, her piety and who she was and the struggle that she put in. Once again, she's a widow. And so the Prophet Sallam offered to marry her. And actually, she kind of didn't um, uh, reply right, uh, right away. She was saying, you know, I have younger children. And it was, she was kind of still had, you know, her kids to take care of. And the Prophet, and she was kind of older, and the Prophet says, "You know what? I'm, I'm older than you." And so the Prophet ends up marrying her. So um, around this time, after or be, after the Battle of Ahad, right? So Inshallah, Taala, hopefully, I mean, I wanted to get to the Battle of Ahzab today. You know, very far from ever even touching that or coming close to it or going over it. But um, Inshallah, Taala, hopefully, you all benefited in the situation. I'm 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 sad to not to see your beautiful faces every Sunday. Um, you know, I can see your name on this like window here. That's all I can really see. But um, and one of the benefits is when we see each other, besides the class, like Annie, it brings happiness to each other when you see other believers, right? Especially people of knowledge and people that want to learn. These are elite people in our community, right? I'm not trying to say that you're so great and you're, you're floating in the sky. But alhamdulillah, yani, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has picked you to um, study the deen and learn and take that time off that, you know, from your regular Sunday schedule. So I miss seeing all you guys. Uh, hopefully, you know, inshallah, ta'ala, we could reunite soon whenever the situation is over. It looks like we're going to be like this for at least a couple more weeks. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you and keep you all healthy. At the end, we'll make dua. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ya kirim, ya rabbil alameen, to forgive us for our wrongdoings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to send your peace and blessings on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his, and his wives, on his companions, and his followers to the day of judgment. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are the sh you are Shafi, Allah so you're the one who gives cure. We ask you to give us a cure for the sickness, Ya Rahman Ya Rahim. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from it, Ya Rahman Ya Rahim. Help us come closer to you from this from, from this incident, Ya Rahman Ya Rahim. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us return us back to our masajid. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to forgive all the Muslims in the world. For, forgive them and protect them, Ya Rahman Ya Rahim. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbi Kara Izati Amma Yasifun. 
وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ولا آله وصحبه أجمعين. May Allah Subhanahu wa bless all of you. Uh, now inshallah ta'ala we'll do the same thing once again next Sunday. And I uh, will continue from there and once again just check for the email. It'll probably be the same link but just check the email for the new link inshallah ta'ala. Barakallahu fikum. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa